And Darwin could easily have computed that. He just didn't but, but know I about the amino acids. He didn't know about the necklace. He didn't know about the string. It's not the mathematics that stumped him. It's the biology. The mathematics is simple. A high school student can compute how many choices there are. Just to could, quickly, because I want to go into the arguments against, but does this, did you have the same response? Does Darwin strike you as beautiful? Never for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen? It was a, a comprehensive synthesis. And so from the standpoint of what scientists look for, it had an, an appeal. It was also well, a well-argued book, The Origin of Species. But it was well-argued on the basis of evidence that was known in the 19th century and right. not things that we've learned mostly from the 20th and 21st. Okay. Did you know that the odds of forming a functional protein by random chance are 1 in 10 to the 77th power? This startling statistic challenges the very foundation of Darwin's theory of evolution. Today, we'll dive into a fascinating discussion with experts who reveal two major problems with Darwinian evolution, the sudden appearance of diverse life forms in the Cambrian explosion and the mathematical improbability of random mutations creating new life forms. Stay tuned to uncover insights that might reshape your understanding of evolution and the origins of life. Okay, we come to that now. Again from David Galarenter's essay, quote, Darwinian, the fossil record, problem one, the fossil record, Darwinian evolution, I'm quoting you, is gradual step by step, yet in the Cambrian explosion of around a half a billion years ago, a striking variety of new organisms, including the first ever animals, pop up suddenly in the fossil record over a mere 70 million years, close quote. Now, 70 million years seems to be plenty of time for all kinds of surprising things, to this layman, explain why is the Cambrian re uh, explosion such a problem for well, Darwin? Well, the Cambrian explosion was something that... Such a problem that it even began to convince this man. Yeah, you know, it was a problem that even Darwin was aware of, and he wrote about it in The Origin of Species. He said it was inexplicable on his view of, of, of life. Uh, but he, he felt that the, the future fossil finds would fill in the, the, the missing ancestral forms that were evident. What happens in the Cambrian is you get uh, a huge number of what are called the uh, animal body plans, uh, where a body plan is a unique configuration of body parts and tissues. And they arrive very abruptly in the fossil record without discernible connection to earlier precursors or earlier ancestors in the Precambrian so record. If, if this wall were the side of a canyon, Halfway up, we'd see... You've, you have a stripe of rock, and in that stripe, you'd find a whole bunch of new forms of, of, of animal life. And that, under, in the layers underneath, there would be no intermediate... There'd be nothing, nothing leading with, to with that. any it discernible connection. Right. right. And so the, the Cambrian explosion itself has been differently dated, but increasingly, the, the, the date that David used of 70 million years is a very generous date for it. The, 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 age, the age range is actually narrowing as a result of additional findings. It's now... About 10 million years is the increasingly accepted date. And there are major explosions. In one Chinese seam, there's 13 to 16 different major groups of animals that have arisen in a 5 to 6 million year window. It's, it's incredibly abrupt geologically when you consider the age of the Earth is 4.5 billion years. It's also very abrupt biologically because there is a mathematical branch of Darwinian theory called population genetics that allows us to calculate how much, how much change, evolutionary change, we ought to expect in a given amount of time if we know things like the mutation rate, the generation time, the right. population sizes. And uh, 5, 10, even 70 million years is a blink of an eye in terms of those, the calculations that can be made for what are called waiting times. And the expected waiting times for the amount of change that's evident in the Cambrian blow out the time scale, if you will. There are hundreds of millions or billions of years. So this is a really unexpected event both biologically, mathematically, and geologically on a Darwinian view of things. All right. As a Christian apologist, I'd like to present why Darwin's theory of evolution should be reconsidered, specifically in light of the fossil record and the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion, occurring around 541 million years ago, presents a significant challenge to Darwin's theory. Darwinian evolution posits that species evolve gradually over long periods through small, incremental changes. We should expect to find numerous intermediate forms in the fossil record, showing a slow transition from simple to complex organisms. However, the Cambrian explosion reveals a different story. During this relatively short period, geologically speaking, about 10 million years, we observe a sudden appearance of a vast array of complex animal body plans, known as phyla. These body plans appear abruptly and fully formed, 
with no clear evolutionary precursors in the preceding fossil record. This rapid emergence of diverse life forms without intermediate stages directly contradicts the gradualism that Darwin's theory relies on. Moreover, the complexity of these early Cambrian organisms is profound. The formation of new body plans requires new proteins, which in turn necessitate new genes. The mathematical probability of these new functional proteins arising through random mutations within such a short time span is exceedingly low. Studies have shown that functional proteins are incredibly rare compared to non-functional sequences, making the random emergence of these complex structures highly improbable. This evidence suggests that the traditional Darwinian model of slow, gradual evolution does not adequately explain the sudden burst of complexity seen in the Cambrian explosion. Instead, it points towards the need for an alternative explanation that can account for the rapid appearance and intricate design of these early life forms. Intelligent design offers a viable alternative by positing that an intelligent cause, rather than random mutations, is responsible for the complexity and diversity of life. It aligns with the evidence of abrupt appearance and intricate organization observed in the Cambrian fossil record. Therefore, in light of the Cambrian explosion, Darwin's theory of evolution should be reconsidered and potentially replaced with a theory that better explains the origins of complex life. Back to David Galarenter, we move from the fossil record. I'm coming to you. Go nowhere. I'm patient. Oh, thank you, David. David Galarenter, Darwin's main problem is molecular biology. Uh, now, this is complicated to me, but I'm going to continue quoting your essay and then ask somebody to unpack it for this layman here, for this layman who can't tell a cat from a dog apart, the, the, the species. I'm, 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 I'm a, treat me as a very slow student. Quoting. What, I'm quoting you, what does generating new forms of life entail? Many biologists agree that generating a new shape of protein is the essence of it. Argument step number one, argument step number two, and inventing a new protein means inventing a new gene. You want to give me the, the, the overview on that one? Steve is the real biologist. Right. And I life <laughs> means new life, new form of life, means new protein, means new gene. Well, I'll, I'll explain it in, in terms that would be familiar to David. If you want to give a computer a new function, write a new program for it to accomplish a new function, you've got to give it new code. And the big discovery of 20th century biology, following Watson and Crick, and what's now called the molecular biological revolution, is the same thing is true in life. You want to invent a new form of life, you've got to have You've got to have code in the form of the information inscribed along the spine of the DNA molecule, and we're learning, and other forms of information. So you need the information to build the, the protein molecules that service the, the, the different types of cells, and then you need additional information to arrange the cells into the body plants. And so the, the Cambrian explosion is an explosion of biological form, but it's also an explosion of biological information. And that fact gives us a way of grappling with this question that Darwin didn't have, because we know something about what it takes to generate information in our high-tech digital world of computing. Right. I, know, I have to say that David Galerner, in his essay, goes very easy on Darwin. First, he calls the theory beautiful and says how sad he is to have to dismiss it. And then he says this molecular stuff, Darwin couldn't have known he that. Couldn't have Nobody. Known. So if, <sighs> tell me if, you tell me if I've got it more or less right. In Darwin's time, it was good enough to imagine that the basic unit of life, a cell, was like a little brick of jello. It was an undifferentiated, quite uncomplicated thing, and you could imagine putting many, many, many of them together and getting different forms of life. Is that roughly fair? Yeah, it was good enough for Darwin. It's probably good enough for us as well, but it's not true. It's not That's true. the big problem. This cell is an unbelievably complex bit of machinery, unfathomably complex. And we haven't understood its complexity at all. Every time we look, there seems to be an additional layer of rebarbative complexity that needs to be factored into our theories. Don't forget, the, the, the eternal goal is to explain the emergence of this complexity. Yes. And if we're continually behind the curve because the complexity is increasing every time we look, that eternal goal is also receding from view, not approaching, it's receding. It's becoming more and more difficult to construct a theory for that. All right, now, somebody give me some notion of the math here. Things are more complicated than Darwin knew. We understand that producing new forms of life 
now means not just new shapes, new activities in which life engages, but a prior code, or is that fair? You're the, you're the man who knows code. You know, the, the mathematical element of this, not of population genetics in, in the uh, complex, sophisticated, predictive sense that um, C was referring to, but just the simple issue of the code. It is remarkable for young people to learn in high school, it's remarkable for me, or in elementary school, to learn that, that proteins, molecules are assembled because there are codes there are codes in the nucleus of cells that spell them out, character by character, codon by codon. This codon means this amino acid, and the next one means that, and the next one means that. But the, but the mathematics, the mathematics underlying these codons is very simple. And, there is, and Darwin could perfectly well have understood if he had the facts. Each one of these positions has to be occupied by one of 20 amino acids. Okay, so. You pick one of 20 guys for this position, and one of 20 guys for this position. You, you like, talked about visualizing a string of beads. Yeah, like okay, a string so of beads. As you're building a protein. Yeah. Right, so you have building four different protein. colored beads, roughly. I'm, build, I'm building a protein out of amino acids, Yes. And, and I'm doing it by choosing the amino acids one by one by one by one by one. Yes. And I have 20 choices each time. Now, if there are several hundred of these things in the string, in the bead, in the necklace. It's a big ne necklace that wraps around your neck 18 times. So there are several hundred, or five times, whatever it is. That's a huge number of possible choices. The number of ways in which you can arrange the emerald followed by the ruby, followed by the opal, followed by the chunk of platinum, and another ruby, and another ruby, and a diamond, and a aquamarine, the number of ways you can arrange that is huge, grows exponentially as the, as the string gets longer. So even when the string is short, even if it's a cheap necklace for your very first girlfriend, and it's all you can afford, it's still there's an astronomical number of choices. And Darwin could easily have computed that. He just didn't but, but know about the amino acids. He didn't know about the necklace. He didn't know about the string. It's not the mathematics that stumped him. It's the biology. The mathematics is simple. A high school student can compute how many choices there are if there are 20 gems for position number one and 20 gems for position number two, and you have 60 gems altogether. And the task here, let me. It's twenty to the six. You're t try to mute. You, so I'm, I'm quoting from your. Even you can. <laughs> even I got it. Right. You got it right. <laughs> I'm even to, mathematicians <laughs> can understand. It. D David, to, da this David yes. Belinsky has a memorable phrase to describe this mathematical problem. He calls it the problem of combinatorial inflation. Yes. Yes. As yes. the length, of, the required length of the protein molecule grows the numbers grow exponentially, they inflate exponentially, and so the, the, the odds of a random search finding the, 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 the one that makes the pretty necklace, to use the, right. other so David's the, metaphor, the, drop precipitously. And in this huge, unimaginably vast universe of possible combinations, the number of combinations that would produce a useful protein is what? Very Exceedingly rare exceedingly rare. And this is what we didn't know until the last, just the last couple decades. There was an extraordinary conference in the 1960s uh, held by, uh, con convened by a number of MIT scientists, some of whom David knew very well, yeah. Murray Eden, Murray Eden. Mar Marco Schussenberger, and uh, they were the first to see the mathematical problem with Darwinism. They called it, the, their conference was called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. But at the, at the time, they could compute the number of possible arrangements, but they didn't know at the time how many of the arrangements would result in functional proteins that would do a job in the cell. And so they didn't know, they couldn't exactly measure how hard the search was, would be on a random, random basis. The, especially the computer scientists, Murray Eden and others, knew that based on computer science, if, if this is functioning like a, a true linguistic system, uh, it's going to be, it's like, uh, unlikely that you can do a random search and find a, meaning, a meaningful string of characters in DNA that will produce a meaningful protein. Okay. But people didn't know in, in the 1960s. By the by early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental measures of the rarity of the functional genes 
and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio is one uh, protein that will fold into a, a functional structure for, uh, compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is 1 over 10 to the 77th power. Darwin's theory of evolution relies heavily on the idea that small, random mutations can accumulate over time, leading to the gradual development of new species. This process hinges on the formation of new proteins, which are the building blocks of life. Proteins are complex molecules made up of chains of amino acids, and their specific sequences determine their function. For a new protein to form, a new gene must be invented, which in turn means that new genetic information must be encoded in the DNA. The process of inventing a new protein is incredibly complex. To put it into perspective, consider the analogy of writing a new program for a computer. Just as a computer needs new code to perform a new function, living organisms need new genetic code to create new proteins. This genetic code is inscribed along the DNA molecule, and any new protein requires precise and specific sequences of amino acids to function correctly. Recent discoveries in molecular biology have shown just how rare functional proteins are compared to non-functional ones. For example, research indicates that the ratio of functional proteins to non-functional sequences is exceedingly low. For a protein that is 150 amino acids long, there might be one functional sequence for every 10 to the power of 77 non-functional sequences. This level of specificity and the improbability of randomly generating a functional protein through mutations pose a significant challenge to the Darwinian model. The concept of combinatorial inflation further exacerbates the problems faced by Darwinian evolution. Combinatorial inflation refers to the exponential increase in the number of possible arrangements of amino acids as the length of the protein chain grows. For example, if you have a protein that is 150 amino acids long, and each position in the chain can be occupied by one of 20 different amino acids, the total number of possible sequences is 20 to the power of 150. This is an astronomically large number, making the probability of randomly stumbling upon a functional sequence vanishingly small. To illustrate this with a simple analogy, imagine trying to form a meaningful sentence by randomly selecting letters from the alphabet. The longer the sentence, the more improbable it becomes to generate a coherent and functional statement by chance alone. In the same way, the longer and more complex a protein, the less likely it is to be formed through random mutations within the available time frame. Moreover, even if a functional protein is somehow formed, it must also be correctly integrated into the existing cellular machinery. This requires not just the right sequence of amino acids but also the right context and environment for the protein to function. The improbability of achieving all these requirements through random processes further undermines the Darwinian explanation. Given these challenges, it becomes clear that the traditional Darwinian model struggles to account for the origin and complexity of new proteins and, by extension, new forms of life. This is where the theory of intelligent design provides a more plausible explanation. Intelligent design posits that the complexity and specificity observed in biological systems are best explained by the action of an intelligent cause rather than random mutations and natural selection. Intelligent design does not reject the evidence for change over time within species, microevolution, but argues that the large-scale changes required to form new body plans and complex structures, macroevolution, cannot be adequately explained by Darwinian processes. Instead, it suggests that an intelligent cause has guided the development of life, ensuring the precise and functional arrangements of genetic information necessary for complex biological systems. In summary, Darwin's theory of evolution faces significant challenges from recent discoveries in molecular biology and the mathematical improbability of forming new functional proteins through random mutations. The concept of combinatorial inflation highlights the astronomical odds against the random generation of functional sequences, further casting doubt on the traditional Darwinian model. Given these challenges, it is reasonable to consider replacing Darwin's theory with a theory that can better account for the complexity and specificity of biological systems. Intelligent design offers a viable alternative, positing that an intelligent cause is responsible for the intricate and purposeful arrangements observed in life. By embracing this perspective, we can develop a more comprehensive and coherent understanding of the origins and development of life on Earth.